welcome to the first issue briefing of the annual meeting of New Champions 2019. I'm Oliver Cam. I'm head of strategic communications here at the World Economic Forum. Um, very, very proud to be on this panel. A brief word before we start. Uh, issue briefings are meant to be a, a bit of fun. They're very short. Hopefully, they're high energy. Um, hopefully, we discuss topics that are a little bit sensitive, a little bit of tension, a little bit of technicality around them. So we encourage you all to stick up your hands, disagree wherever you, wherever you find an opportunity. Uh, and, and hopefully this half hour will pass so quickly. Um, you know, we're looking forward to the next one. My name is Oliver Kahn, as I said. This, one is, this session is about artificial intelligence, a very, very fitting theme for this, uh, this meeting. We've been talking a lot about the benefits of artificial intelligence and emerging technology in general to lift humanity and take us forward and help us address the global challenges that we know we face. And yes, at the same time, with, um, with the help of some public opinion research that we commissioned in the past few weeks, we're finding that the global public are not convinced about the benefits of artificial intelligence. Uh, not only do they feel that governments should be more restricted, they also feel, by and large, that companies should be more regulated. And whilst we don't want to see artificial intelligence banned, there's a sizable mi mi minority, around 40% of people globally across the world, that believe there is a, a deal of concern around its, its use. So that's a quite big weighty subjects when the rest of the three days we'll be talking about how great technology is. So let's try to level the playing field a little bit and talk about these very real concerns. Now to do that, I've got three amazing panelists. Li Feng Liu uh, is the CEO for China for Ipsos, uh, our partner that helped us with this research. Uh, Kitty Parry, the chief executive officer of DeepView, uh, a, a technology a startup which uh, is very much involved in artificial intelligence, also a young global leader the World Economic Forum, and our very own Zvika Krieger, the uh, Head of Technology Policy at the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's a World Economic Forum um, Centre based in San Francisco, and it's set up with the sole purpose of, of trying to nudge forward technology governance and making sure that those measures and those frameworks are in place to ensure that technology, not just AI, but lots of other stuff, suits humanity and rather, rather than ends us up being served, you know, serving it. So, Li Feng, you're the numbers guy. Let's take a little bit of a look into these numbers. And first of all, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're as surprised as I personally was. Actually, we have a lot of interesting um, findings from this survey. Uh, for your reference, this survey is conducted uh, across 27 countries among 20,000 respondents. Actually, it's a large sample. We are quite confident about the result itself. We actually have found a lot of interesting um, findings. Uh, for example, as Oli just mentioned, more than 40%, actually 41% of respondents said they were worried about the use of AI. So this compares to 20% compares to of them disagreed, and also 32% of them, they are not undecided. So we can see largely 40% of people, they have some concerns about use of AI. When asked whether the use of AI by companies, by commercials, should be regulated more strict, strictly than it is today, actually almost half percent, half the respondents, which means 48% of respondents said they're great. Actually, we should have more regula regulation on the use of AI by companies. When we go to the, um, uh, the use of government using AI, actually, people have less, less concern. So it's about 40% people, they believe, actually, uh, we should have more regulation uh, for the um, use of AI by the government. <laughs> and we have a very, very important findings. Actually, all this kind of concern is widely spread by all the populations, by all the different group of populations by age, by gender, by education level, by, by, by income, we can see actually everyone has the concern about the use of AI. Although that actually only 19% of the people, they believe we actually should ban AI for using AI. So people are still quite welcome the use of AI. And if we look at the different group of people, actually we can only find a little bit differences among different ages. So the younger people, probably they have less concern than the older people. And people who actually have higher education have a little bit less concern about the use of AI. And also, very interesting findings is men, 
seems has less concern about use AI than female. So that's, I think that's the key uh, findings from this survey we have today. Yeah. So a remarkable similarity between, between sex, between a, across ages, mm -hmm. uh, and across education levels too. So it's not the uh, very little difference between uh, those with low education, fearing AI, and those with high education, fearing AI. And, mm -hmm. and, and likewise, um, digitally savvy, um, you know, digital natives of the younger generations equally as concerned as older people that find it a little bit strange. I find that strange. Li Feng, do you? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, if we look at data, it's a little bit strange. I believe the young generation, or actually the people who have higher education should have less concern. But I believe we didn't conduct uh, in-depth interviews among these people. We should do more surveys to understand better. But my guess on that is actually, I think people, they worry about the data, how to use the data. Maybe it relates to data privacy or all these kind of things we need to probably figure out more in the future. Well, Kitty, you're, you're a young global leader, <laughs> so uh, with, with young in your title. Let's, let's, put that, let's put that to you. I mean, generationally, there's, there seems to be very little difference. And, 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 and I think the message is, the overriding message is, is not getting through that AI is, is, is a benefit to society. And what's more, companies less, less trusted than governments, according to this survey. And I think, I think the reasons for the balance in age will be very different. Maybe, maybe the older generation don't necessarily quite understand how it works, but the younger generation will understand how it works, and with that, the biases that come with it. So we all know that a person in a white coat, if it's a man, the AI thinks it's a doctor. If it's a woman in a white coat, it's a beautician. Now, the problem where you've got, and I believe that might be why we're seeing the sex differentiation, the biases are being formed in the AI and consolidated by the humans that train it. So I, to your question, believe that might be why we see that corporates versus government are less trusted, because people believe that corporates might be seeking the commercial gain rather than the governments, and with that comes the possible ill intention in some forms. Um, and all we have to do is continue to fight harder for the good use of it, because where it's powerful and useful for us, AI can be transformative in its service to us. Do you think it's fair? Uh, do you think, uh, is this to just cast um, the private sector in a poor light? I think the private sector can always, <laughs> private sector is shining for many reasons in good light, and in the same balance, there are companies that are, have different intentions and not such a good light. So I think a sweeping brush and government can, un can come under the same tarnish. Um, sometimes we don't know what the governments might have the power and ability to do for the right reasons that can cause fear mongering. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think necessarily think it's right that we're tarnishing all the corporates, but I think it's important that we're an educated society and we know how it is working and we're learning with the technology. And it is our job as leaders of organizations to be incredibly transparent about how our technology is used in life, in the people we affect, and how that data is being amalgamated to form intelligence and form summations of, of the people it's being surveilling or looking at. Feel free to get your questions prepped, because we want to have as much time for questions as possible. But let's, let's just uh, dwell on that point one, uh, one moment longer, because we talked just before this session uh, you're banned by GDPR now in, in, yeah. in Europe. So there are rules in place, and this is a good time after this, we'll come to Zvika, of course, on the government side. There are rules in place. And do you think the, the environment is that we've gone beyond the Wild West where now we're getting some, some, some good, good confines from which to you know, fully and ethically develop this technology? It's funny, I, do, I think GDPR is very powerful, and yeah, thank you, our, our, our company is built from a GDPR foundation. The wonderful thing about being in Europe is you learn it quickly, otherwise, I have a, a lot of questions to answer from some very senior people. Um, but I think the bigger concern is where there aren't regulation, and it, that's sex biases, it's age biases, um, it's being used for mal, malpractice. And that's actually where the regulation is formed, the technology is being reviewed and surveyed and questioned. But there isn't, there isn't regulation around bias. There isn't regulation about assessing how this technology is forming the natural human instincts that maybe we want to consider or potentially even remove. That's where I think we need to be looking at some of the questions moving forwards. 
Uh, and speaking of, so what are, what, are, what are the center's priorities for, for looking at those governance gaps and, 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 and putting those rules in place? So, uh, I mean, I, just taking a step back, I think that this survey could not have come at a better time. I think that we are right now at a major turning point in terms of public perception about uh, these emerging technologies and AI in particular. And I, I might even argue that we're seeing a sea change in terms of public perception of these technologies. Uh, for many years, there was a lot of ignorance about these technologies. And uh, public awareness is just now starting to catch up. And whether it is the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal or the other headlines that we're seeing from some, a lot of the um, social media platforms and the misuse of these technologies, public consciousness is finally starting to catch up with how these technologies could be used for ill in addition to how they could be used for bad. And so I'm, I'm not at all surprised to see these findings, which I think that uh, largely derived from what, what we in Silicon Valley have, have, have sort of described as the ethos of the technology sector, which is move fast and break things. And uh, what that really implies is that, you know, let's not worry now about the implications of what we're doing. Let's just barrel ahead with our blinders on and drive the technology on uh, to, to, its, to its extreme. And I think that that is now finally catching up with these technologies. Uh, earlier this year, we had our annual meeting in Davos, and I think one of the people asked what it was sort of the, the buzzword of the year this year, and I would say the buzzword of the year for us this year was tech lash, which is the backlash against, against technology companies. And what I'm starting to see, first of all, from our uh, private sector partners, from uh, corporate leaders from around the globe, is that uh, this is not just uh, about uh, PR or corporate social responsibility. This is actually starting to hit at the core business interests of these companies, that if public opinion is turning against these technologies, this isn't just a marketing issue, this is going to hit their bottom line. And so there is a financial and business case imperative for companies to think about the impacts of these technologies on society and to design, deploy, and procure them responsibly. And we have a number of projects that we're working on at the forum that create tools to help companies be leaders in the responsible uh, design and deployment of technology. And we have a tremendous demand from corporate leaders for guidance on how to do this. How do we actually ensure that our technology is being used responsibly? Decisions that are being made deep in the trenches of the developers and the coders and the, and the engineers are very quickly rising up to the level of the C-suites who are being held accountable for the impacts of those decisions. And so this is a, a completely new challenge for a lot of companies. And if I might just uh, address the flip side of that, we talked about um, the, the government. And uh, you know, yes, uh, the survey showed that 48% uh, you know, of people think that technology companies should be more regulated, whereas only 40% said how government use of AI should be uh, controlled. But 40% is still a lot, and that's still the majority of respondents said that gov government use of, of AI needs to be curbed. And I think that particularly we're seeing use cases around facial recognition technology, uh, the, the provision of government services uh, through AI. Increasingly, we're seeing chatbots that are being used uh, uh, for government services. And um, what I would say is that on the one hand, yes, we absolutely need uh, to ensure that governments are using this technology responsibly. But uh, I spent most of my career in government before I joined uh, the World Economic Forum. And what I saw, I see the flip side is that governments are actually so concerned about these ethical and legal implications of, of artificial intelligence that they're actually not using the technology at all. They're just saying, oh, it's just too complicated. I'd rather not use it, which is a big shame because these technologies could revolutionize the use of citizen service, uh, the provision of citizen services. And so uh, another project that we have is uh, creating uh, common sense guidelines to empower governments to procure AI responsibly. And uh, we just released guidelines uh, that were adopted by the UK government for their responsible procurement of AI that we, that we drafted in collaboration with the, uh, with the government there. And we have 14 other governments around the world who are in the process of adopting those guidelines as well. And so there is certainly a demand, uh, an imperative to balance these legitimate concerns with AI, but also make sure that we're not losing some of those societal benefits. Uh, so let's have a quick show of hands. Thank you, Zika. Uh, OK, anybody else? We'll try to do one or two at the same time. OK, in that case, David, the uh, gentleman here. Could you remind us where you're from and your name, please? Hi, th thank you. Uh, Daniel Mihailov, I'm the head of data innovation at Wellcome Trust. Uh, great discussion, thank you. So um, we're very worried about this Wellcome Trust. Wellcome Trust is a big foundation focused on funding healthcare um, and health research. 
And obviously health data and AI and health data is a big growing field. So we're worried enough about this. We've just announced a $100 million fund to study the problem of trust and trustworthiness in, in AI. The question for the panel is this. Often the response by tech leaders seems to be, how can I be more trusted? But that strikes me as the wrong response. The response should be, how can I be more trustworthy? Mm -hmm. Because trust, saying you, you want to be more trusted, saying I need to convince the public they might be wrong. But actually, as for example, Catherine said, often they're right to be worried. Thank you. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll cogitate over that one for a bit and we'll just get the microphone sweeping over to this side of the room. Two people here. It's about trusted or trustworthy, number one. Hello, I'm Don Crawford. I'm from the US and I am CEO of a, a medical device a company that uses AI machine learned algorithms. And you know, a survey that says that people are concerned about AI is, is one piece of data, but are they really concerned about their security and their privacy mm -hmm. as opposed to AI? Mm -hmm. I mean, AI is one, or, they, or, or are they, you know, concerned that AI will give a bad answer. I have my own bias that it's about security, not really about AI as the technology itself, security and privacy, which is utmost importance in healthcare. And that would have been interesting for us to delve into. We'll, we'll ask that, but of course it also can mean job fear as well, fear of loss of, loss of jobs. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't delve into that, but we'll, we'll discuss that as well. Sir, let's have, take your question, please. My name is Oliver Morgan. I'm from the World Health Organization in Geneva. I actually had a very r similar question, which is whether the survey looked at whether people were uh, concerned about the way their data is collected rather than the AI applications itself, and whether you're able to tease that out. Thank you. Okay, I can answer that. No, it wasn't. Uh, this is a, this is a, it's a, a new... Um, you know, a little bit of fun we're having with Ipsos where we, we, we just ask, just ask a couple of questions to shape this debate, but it's very, very good feedback. But Lee Fung, perhaps as an organization, you've done some other research in this area. Yeah, I think um, um, there are two key components in, the, in AI. One is actually data. The other one is technology. If we put it in a sim very simple way. So, of course, I somehow I agree with you too, which Don. I think uh, the concern from the people is the data because you, you have data everywhere and you generate data everywhere. There are companies that can collect the data anytime, everywhere from, you, for, from, from yourself. And then how this data is used is probably the biggest concern for, for many people. I think that when they, when they consider AI, of course, they are thinking of the data, how the data is generated, how data is collected, and also how, data, how the data is used. I think that in the other survey we have made, we, we can see uh, those kind of uh, um, perception from, uh, from the respondents that um, people worry about the, the data privacy. Of course, this is why GDPR is widely uh, applied in many countries. Even in China, actually, there are a lot of things happening about how can we protect the data privacy from consumers. Well, that, that perhaps begs a bigger question, which is whether it's a security or privacy or fear of, fear of you know, loss of job and displacement. It doesn't matter so much as the fact that the societal benefits, there was a disequilibrium <laughs> in terms of fear and the societal benefits. We, had, we just had, before this session, why we were a, bit, a little bit late, the co-chairs press conference, and we had Jessica Tan talking about the remarkable benefits AI has brought in terms of healthcare in China, in terms of training doctors uh, and lowering the cost and, and, and creating more greater accessibility for, for, for healthcare. That's just one example. So, but sure, there are lots of um, benefits, and, and we're going to be spending a lot of time in this meeting talking about them. But there is, nevertheless, a, a disequilibrium. The, the, the public aren't seeing that. Well, I think that there's a, I think there's a few few issues in there. One is, you know, what is not AI these days? I mean, AI is in everything, right? And I mean, there's, there's there's barely a digital tool that you can think of that doesn't use some element of AI or machine learning. Uh, in, in your day-to-day -day life. And so I think that when you're looking at a survey like this, we, I, I do think, as, as per the questions that were asked, you have to disaggregate what might be some of the concerns that people have. And I do think that there are issues around uh, privacy and how data is collected. But when a question is particularly posed about AI, my sense is that there, those, those concerns fall into two categories. One is what kinds of decisions are being automated? And how are those decisions going to affect my life? 
Uh, some of the more controversial use cases that we've seen in the media is around uh, uh, AI-assisted uh, uh, courtroom decision making, right? And and uh, uh, if bail is being set or if uh, court, you know, uh, tickets are being issued mm. based on uh, computer-generated data data that has, has proven to have biases, you know, in the U.S. disproportionately biased towards people of, against people of color, for example. Uh, uh, even uh, is AI being used to make decisions about my loans uh, at banks? We're increasingly seeing that. Or uh, we, we've been talking about medical devices. Are AI, is AI being used to diagnose me? And it's very interesting to see, you know, in which situations are those fears rational? In which situations are those fears irrational? Because on the one hand, you may be, uh, you, may, you may have a fear that a, a machine diagnosing you is going to be uh, worse than a doctor, but the data might show that actually it's more accurate than a, than, a, than a doctor diagnosing you, let alone a machine performing surgery on you, which data has shown can be more accurate or more effective, but most people still might respond to a survey like this saying, no, I actually don't want a machine to perform surgery on me, even if it is more effective th than, a, than a human surgeon. But I do think that if we're on an, an open-ended survey like this, where we're saying, you know, do, you know, do you, are you worried about AI? I do think, and you mentioned it earlier, that the other major concern is jobs and job dislocation. And I think that we're seeing a lot of that uh, here in the U.S. Uh, uh, not, well, we're not in the U.S. right now, but it, uh, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of that around the world. Um, still, I'm still on jet lagged a little bit, <laughs> um, but we, uh, but we are seeing that when when people fear AI, they're fearing automation and they're fearing loss of jobs. And so I I do think that, that a lot of that is what is driving uh, some of the survey respondents as well. Can I also jump in? And, and I think um, if the if this pen, if you if you're asked whether you think this pen can be used for bad, of course it can. It can be used to stab people, right? Was the intention of this pen to be used for bad? No, absolutely not. It was a very simple pen to write with. And I think the basis is for many people the understanding of what artificial intelligence really is at its core is a very difficult thing for us to comprehend because very few of us were at primary school when they were teaching us what artificial intelligence was. And we criticize rightly what we don't understand because we don't understand the components of the process. Our technology is alerting organizations when there is a data leak outside of their organization before the hackers get it to prevent the cybersecurity breaches that we're seeing on a daily basis. Our technology cannot see any other behavior other than these data leaks. So thereby, when the intention is good, and if it's being governed and responsibly managed by the people building it to make sure the pen is only being used for good, then we can use and empower our society so well to all the points where it's become so powerful in our lives to remove the human biases and allow the technology to uh, grow our lives. And, and could I just, I want to underline the point that was made earlier about um, trusted versus mm -hmm. trustworthy. I think that is absolutely the right paradigm. I think that uh, for too many companies over the past few years, it's been about uh, the PR and the spin and saying, you know, let us prove to you that what we're doing is sufficient. Where increasingly what we're seeing is that it's not, right? That companies are actually not worthy of trust and that we need to move beyond these cosmetic reforms, you know, installing an ethics advisory board or, uh, or a committee to handle this and that or putting, putting out these guidelines, but make fundamental decisions that, that, that may actually uh, challenge aspects of the business model and may actually cut into profits. But what we're seeing is that that, that, that calculus is starting to shift and companies are realizing that, this, that, that consumers are increasingly aware of this, as we see from the surveys, and that we actually need to uh, they, they need to make real changes or risk real uh, harm to their business interests down the road. And so I think they need, that companies are moving from just being see, wanting to be seen as trusted to actually being worthy of that trust. That's great. And, and uh, you know, the risk of um, evoking the, the Swiss god of timing uh, in a bad way, I'm going to actually go over here because we started a little bit late and there's a gentleman in the front row who wants to ask a question. David, can we uh, get a microphone over here? Anybody else want to get a question before we... Uh, we wrap up. Okay, so let's do three quick questions. Gentleman there, lady on the front row. So. Uh, thanks for running over, and we'll blame it on jet lag. Um, <laughs> so the question I have is, you're, there, you're talking about trust, and trust is... Sorry, so, sir, where are you from? Uh, you? Chris Merritt from Cloudflare out of San Francisco, also jet lagged. Um, <laughs> so we're talking about trust around AI, and trust is a bit of an emotional thing, and it's the rise of influencers. So we've been talking about 
what's the foundation of trust and is it, is it broadly understood and is it rational? Uh, I think the question is what's the role of influencers and what's the role of policymakers in providing a safety net and emotional stability for folks as AI does rise? We're in the early days, so there's the t traditional news outlets and then there's everybody else on Twitter and YouTube that is influencing across many. So I'd, I'd like to get some perspective on how do we think about the role of influencers and just, uh, just sort of open it at that point. That's a really good question. Gentlemen, uh, there, third row. Hi. Thanks. Hello. Uh, Amish Bissoon from CEO out of South Africa, uh, Research Consulting. Just an interesting question around how was the data, were there any differences between countries? Um, I know you said, uh, you know, gender, race, you know, all similar, but is there any differences between countries? And, you know, how, if there were, what were the reasons for those differences? Um, were certain countries, were, were, were people more trusting in certain countries compared to other, others? And how can we use that uh, in, you know, in informing this going forward? Great question. Okay, Lee Fen can talk to that one. Uh, lady on the front row, red dress. Thanks. Hi, Angela Baker with Qualcomm. Um, I had a question on uh, the back end. So I think, Kitty, you talked about it a little bit, but we've there, with, with the ushering in of 5G and the fact that everything is going to be connected and your fridge is going to talk to your dialysis machine. And so, you know, I know you mentioned that remote surgery c could be safer, but it might be safer for a 185 pound male, but not if you're a 95 pound female, right? And so this goes back to the, the point of who is creating the AI. And, you know, the ship has sailed a little bit on the things that are being created because they are being created traditionally, at least in the West, by white males. So how do we get ahead of that now and, and have people creating technology and doing the machine learning on the back end that will be beneficial to many different kinds of people? That is a great question. How's the ship sailed? Kitty. <laughs> um, immediately to Angela's question, um, Alexa came to mind where it was recording, of course, when you compare the fridge and the coffee machine talking to each other, you combine that with Alexa's listening powers and you suddenly got a whole ton of data that the engineers were getting very excited building Alexa. They didn't see the problem with it because the more intelligence they had, the better they could train the model and that was all right. But of course, when they're listening to domestic violence, they then have a very serious case on their hands. And I think the training and the common sense guidelines to ensure that the engineers who, whose number one priority is to make sure that their technology is intelligent, have actually understood the ramifications in our society for how that technology could be intelligent, must be continually reviewed and, um, and, and, and to a common sense approach, of course, because over-regulation is inhibitive, not supportive, and it's really important that that balance is is met. Um, and I think um, in terms of uh, the policy versus the influencers, there's um, the one lady that I thought was quite interesting in terms of the influencers that I just wanted to touch on is um, a, white ha hacker, a white hat hacker, sorry, mouthful, jet lag, combination, awful, um, who has spoken very much about how photos and videos are being used to hack organizations. She literally talks about somebody putting a photo on the internet, Microsoft Word is out of date. They pretend to be from the IT department. Hi, Fred, just jumping, need to jump on your computer. I'm from the IT department, and I can see Microsoft Word is out of date. I'm going to send you a link. In the link, click on it and then I'll get onto your computer and update Microsoft Word. Without AI technology to ensure that those photos are removed from the public internet so the hackers and so on can't access that intelligence, companies are going to really, really struggle because that is too much data that is leaking for any human to keep up with that power. You're flowing into... Yeah, well, I <laughs> Jump mean, in. I, I just wanted to actually jump on your Alexa example, okay. getting back to your question about um, white men uh, doing most of the coding. Uh, have you noticed that most of our uh, service chatbots are voiced by women? Alexa, Siri, <laughs> Cortana, the voice of Waze, you know, a, a lot of uh, Google Maps. 
Well, so, so absolutely. No, that, that, that's exactly the point that I, that I was going to make is that um, yeah. there's actually a, a sort of nascent field of research that's looking at how a lot of our societal biases, A, not only drive our design decisions, but then how those design decisions reinforce how we, how we treat people in the real world. I have a five-year-old son, and there's been re research that says that this looked at children after they've been uh, working with these chatbots, uh, how that's, that's changed their attitude towards women in the real world, where when you yell at Siri, Siri says, oh, I'm so sorry for upsetting you, <laughs> right? And so an engineer made that decision about how Siri would respond to that. And so there's actually, you know, the genderization of chatbots is actually a, a whole fascinating topic. We could have a whole other panel on that yeah, on that later. Explore, um, but I think that um, that that, that we uh, that there absolutely there are a number of important initiatives. Uh, AI for all is one that comes to mind. That there are uh, women who code. Uh, you know, lot, lots of other uh, organizations that are trying to increase diversity uh, in the developer pool that is absolutely essential for, uh, for, for uh, addressing these kinds of biases that start deep in the trenches where the technology is developed. I also just want to um, quickly address the, uh, the point that you made about policymakers and what is the role of policymakers. Um, I, I'll share a, a sort of off the record conversation that I had uh, with a senior science and technology policy person uh, at a, in a G7 country, let's say, and, uh, and, I, and I wanted to talk to him about policy responses to bias in AI and gender bias in AI and, and how government can, can play a role. And he said, you know, if, I, if I'm walking down the street and I, and I bump into a random woman, uh, I meet on the street and I ask her, do, do you know that AI is biased against women? Do you care that AI is biased against women? She, she wouldn't even know what I'm talking about. So why should the government get involved and get, spin people up about things and get them concerned about things that, uh, that, they're not even con that they don't even know about? And uh, first of all, he obviously didn't read this survey, so uh, he didn't know that people are concerned about it. But what I said to him is, well, you know, one might argue that that's actually exactly the role of government, to protect people from things that they don't know that they, should, that they're, that they're, that they are being harmed by. And so I do think that government has a unique role to play when it comes to technology. Of course, we don't want over-regulation, so we don't want to stifle innovation. But because there's such a large gap in awareness between how these technologies affect people, government has a responsibility to step in. All right, thanks, Vika. Two more questions, yours and then mine. I always get the last question. First, for all of issue briefings. Um, let's talk about the country differentials, oh, okay. Kifang. I just want to add one, one sentence before I answer a question sure. uh, about country differences. I think at Ipsos, we did a lot of survey regarding the trust. Actually, trust plays a very important role in driving the performance of your brand and your corporate corp reputation. So it's very important that you, you need to work on how, how do you convince people to trust you. I think this is um, the key factor to make sure you are successful in your brand, brand and also your corporate reputation. So I think as a government, as a, com a company, when we Im imp imply AI is quite important, how can we influence people? to make people trust this, the use of AI is acceptable, it's good. I think it's a big question in the future we can, we can work on, yeah. Indeed, there are, there are a lot of differences uh, across different countries, and, but we didn't have much time today to, to go to the details. I have a kind of rough feeling that uh, the emerging markets, they have less concerns. And I think probably the eastern countries mm -hmm. probably also have less concerns regarding use of AI. But better, I suggest you to go to the details. We have a detailed report. You can check all the details. There are 27 countries, and each country we have, uh, uh, most of the countries have 1,000 respondents or above. And uh, probably 14 countries, we have 500 respondents above. So you can see a very um, detailed information from the survey. So I just want to wrap up by asking, and it's actually going back to your question of influence. We, look, we try to influence things. That's the reason why we had this, uh, this piece of research, and that's why we didn't spend a lot of time going to the data, because we, we want to just frame the conversation. Do you think, my dear panelists, whether this research will influence the rest of this meeting, or do you think that message has already been absorbed loud and clear, or do you think it, it will be ignored because the business benefits are just too great? You have to say yes. Of course. <laughs> no, joking. Sorry. Um, honestly, I'm just nervous. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I think, I think it absolutely does. But the questions behind why the responses have been uh, as they are is so, so critically important. And also, 
the understanding of the question and its, and its focus on, in the way it's been asked, can this pen be used for bad? Okay. And the balance of that is, uh, is, is uh, very important for us to be aware of before we start understanding the questions, because I do feel, looking at these answers, you could say too many of the responses are focused in a bad way because the question is. Actually, I think it's all about educating and making sure that people understand technology. And as a CEO, oh goodness, I won't do that again, sorry everyone. Um, I would make a pledge to anyone we work with, shareholders or clients or any of my team, that if any of them want to know the process the technology is built, how it influences their lives, I have a pledge to sit down with them and talk it through. And that's my responsibility as a CEO of a tech company. And I think it's critical that any CEO of any tech company is open to that and make sure that happens. Thanks, and, and Zvika, how do we uh, ensure the leaders of this meeting, it's a meeting of leaders, take this message on board, or have they already? I think that for most, most companies will only change the way they design and deploy technology if they get a strong signal that it will affect their bottom line. <laughs> And so the more data points that we can share, mm -hmm. that, we, that, that public opinion is changing, that we are in the middle of a turning point, uh, the more likely we will get leaders to stand up and notice and start asking these deeper questions of, okay, you've convinced me that, that my consumers are scared of AI, why? And how am I contributing to that fear? And what do I need to do to overcome that fear? So I think data like this is crucial in shifting the narrative and getting leaders to act, think, and more importantly, act differently. What a fascinating discussion. It always saddens me when, uh, when they, they come to an end. But they have, and we've gone over. So thanks for indulging us. And, and, and sorry for you know, putting your schedules off, off course. Um, thank you, Lee Thung, Kitty, Speaker. Thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, I hope you uh, have a great meeting and come again and join us again in this lovely room where we can speak our minds and be free. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.